Awesome. I got all my stuff on here. Well, hi everybody. Hi. There we go. We can, that's that. So we have official greeting. Is that is that the next thing going on there? I got to figure out my notes. Is that what the, our, oh no, it's our our services. So um, we are. So you can see there's a few extra lights and a few extra things going on here. They're all trying out today. So hopefully we all look good. Even have a different microphone up on everything like that. So. Eager to see, uh, eager to get ready and worship our God. We're focusing for four weeks on the core values of um, this congregation. We kind of had set those up a year ago, and in fact, on your way out, if you're interested, you can have like a, a folded half sheet if you want to see the whole list and kind of what the core things and the vision of what this congregation was. If you want to grab it and take a look at it, you can, or if you're like, I don't want to grab that piece of paper, just let me know and I can even email you a copy. Uh, but the four we're focusing on are mentoring, moldable, moldable, merciful, and mutual service. Today we're looking at uh, that moldable. So look forward to that. We'll have a couple of guest preachers in the middle of it, and we'll continue to look at how we can carry our mission of Christ. And it fits really well because today we're seeing lots of moldable stuff because we're changing stuff every single week, trying to do it better. Uh, not because we like change necessarily, but because we know we want to do the best that we can for our Savior Jesus. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. There we go. Good morning, community of the faithful. Good morning, God. Let's uh, worship our God. Uh, here's our uh, theme for the week, and also we're in the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, kind of the big teaching season, but we're getting ready to focus on the life of Christ real soon. Uh, so let's uh, invoke the name of our triune God. In the name of the Father, who is the faithful one. In the name of the Son, who faithfully carry out his mission to save the world. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who makes us faithful by his word and sacraments. Amen? Amen? Dear community of the faithful, our congregation is named not for us, but for our God. He is the faithful one. He is holy and perfect and punishes unfaithfulness with eternal separation from him. But by the faithfulness of Jesus, God has sacrificed himself in our place. By the faithful power of the Holy Spirit, God has called us to be part of his family here. I invite you to join me and confess your sins and believe the good news. Faithful God, I have been unfaithful in my thoughts, words, and actions. And do not deserve a relationship with you, but ask for your mercy because of Jesus. Forgive me, renew me, and make me faithful to you. God planned and promised to take your sins away. He is faithful, and the work of paying for your sins is finished. Jesus is risen. God has made you his faithful children, being freed from sin, death of the devil. Be faithful to your God. Amen. Amen. Captain Jackson, and we have a kind of white sense that you can just grab it and turn it on. And you can, you can just put it back, like I said. Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, starting with verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head. Since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of these things teach you 
that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. This is the word of the Lord. You don't have to sing, you can. I'm singing first. There we go. Yeah, that's all good. We got to get it figured out. So uh, please join me in singing our next song. Cornelius answered, three days ago, 
I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for him immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does, not, does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Deacon. Scared if you lose a microphone like that. And you said, uh, get ready for this. I gotta show you this. Who knows what this is? If you know what this is, and you think you do, when I count to three, you can yell it all tonight. It's first of all my favorite color. But uh, it's what it is. It's kind of smushy like this. If you know what it is, it has a certain brand name, and it comes in a thing that looks kind of like this. When I, when I count to three, see if you can say it. One, two, three. No. Oh. It's Play-Doh, yeah. yeah. It's, I heard though it might be like a generic name. But if I take this, and right now, and I mold it like this, I put it in a shape, and when I count to three, tell me what you think it is. Ready? One, two, three. Oh. It's a ball, yeah. Okay, so now if I do this, and I mold it a little bit differently like this, like this, or whatever, this, get this, I'm okay, kind now I take some of that off, put a little on here, I take a little some of that off, and then I put it over here. Now I make something that maybe fits with a Christian church. When I count to three, tell me, hopefully, what you think that looks like. One, two, three. A cross. A cross. Oh man, I am a good artist. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> you took the time, and you can change this into a lot of things. You can make little people out of it. Uh, give me a, a sign. Anybody here love working with clay or doing stuff like this? There we go. That's that is awesome. I have. I I never was a big guy in clay, uh, but a couple of my kids were. But you can change all this. But there's actually something inside of here that has value that you wouldn't want to change, and it's deep on the inside. And that's where, if it was a COVID time, I'd have somebody come up. But if you take it, you look in there. There's actually a dime in the middle. There's a dime in the middle. This has real value. So all this you can change, but it doesn't have the the dime state inside of whatever that shape was. And the illustration is that when it comes to what God tells us to do, we have something that you, you can't change. And that's the change I have in here. Um, that has value. And that's the message of the gospel, Jesus Christ. It needs to be in there. Now, what it looks like on the outside can change. So how Christians do it and what Christians look like and what churches look like and how they do that and all kinds of things can change. And it's very moldable. That's where you look at you can, even get, you can even get rid of certain parts. You have to keep on taking parts off. But what I don't want to do is ever take the part that has the dime off of here, right? Because that has the value. I've got to, oh, I got, I, I, oh, there it is. Oh, I still have what's valuable on the inside. And as we continue to look at how we do everything here or how you live your Christian life, there isn't one way it needs to look like on the outside, but it has to have the value of Jesus Christ in the middle. If you are excited that Jesus gives us lots of options, but gives us real value in life, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Awesome. Indeed. Let's uh, join now in the Apostles' Creed. And that is... We join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come on judge the living and the dead. I will believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's join in the sing one more time together. like change, but they don't they don't get much of a vote, right? The reality is is that change is always difficult. It's always a struggle, and for some people more than others. During this COVID-19 time, it's been change that's been forced upon us. People have had to do things differently, and that tends to be what really makes it not something we enjoy. If it's change that we don't get to decide, we don't like it almost all the time. But if we get to choose, if we get to decide what we change, then we tend to like it, or we like it at least a lot more. Uh, for example, uh, I think most people don't eat the same food every, every day for every meal. And if you are forced to change, you tend not to like it. So I know we have uh, school, in-person school is starting up this next week, which is exciting for some. And one of the things that I remember as a kid is I wasn't always a big fan of school lunch. Why? Because they would change it and not give me a vote, right? I would just get in line, and then a lady, uh, that nice lady would say, here's your peas, here's your Salisbury steak, here's your milk, no, you can't have chocolate, you get what I gave you. It's different than yesterday, but I didn't cause the change. I didn't like it. But I always enjoyed it if my parents were to say, hey, Paul, we're going out to eat, and you can order whatever you want. Oh! I like having a change of pace when I get to control it, then I like change. So the key to change is making sure that you want to know, you want to do it, that you're behind it, you understand why you do it. And now we're gonna we're gonna talk about change in a church, change in our church, change in what we do. Take a look at some of those things. That's you can see change. One person has it conquered in this picture, and the rest are kind of being laid out by it, right? And when it comes to your life as a Christian, when it comes to our life as a congregation, 
we have to find ways to deal with things we have to change to know what we can't change. Now I have a little diagram for you that uh, somebody smarter than me has done the research. And when it comes to change, this is where you can find most people. As I describe this little chart, like I use this in one of my uh, leadership classes I teach, uh, I want you to think about where you might think you find yourself on this chart of change. So way over close to me uh, is that group called the innovators. Those are the people who come up with new ideas and like ready to go and sometimes they ch they're ready to change right away. Uh, an innovator comes up with a new thing to do. And then the early adopters are the people that maybe they, they, they're ready for change, they're looking for change, and they're, they like to listen to the innovator. They like new ideas and they're the first ones to pick up the idea right after the innovators. Then we have the early majority that kind of sees that that early adopter group doing it, and they're, they're looking for change, but they're not eager to change necessarily, but once they see that some people are getting something pretty nice, they'll consider it and they'll try it out, and they'll go forward with it if it works. And then we have the late majority. These people, uh, they're slower to change, but when they see that half the people have already changed, they see half the people are already doing this new thing or using this new tool, they're ready to look into it because they let the first people go and test it out. And now they have a lot of people that are doing it, they're ready to go. And then finally we have the group that's called the Lagers, which this doesn't sound like a good name. It's not meant to be picking on something. Innovator sounds exciting and Lagers sounds bad. A Lager, you need everybody on this chart, by the way. Otherwise you have a disaster, but it's, it's built this way for a reason. God made people the way they are for a reason. Uh, the Lagers are the ones that don't want to change at all. And they will change only when they have to, or when they finally get convinced. And it takes a while. They finally get convinced that they need to change. It has to become their idea, but there's a lot to convince them. They don't do it because other people do it. They don't do it because everybody's doing it. They do it because they see there's a reason to do it, or there's no other way to do it. And that's where COVID has changed. A lot of laggards had to change a lot of stuff because they had to. They had to work from home, or they had to do this. It's just the way it is. Uh, let me give you uh, some uh, examples. Uh, so, uh, like with the with the laggard, um, you get um, some people that are um, just hesitant, hesitant to change. So, where I used to be at St. Marcus, large organization, a lot of employees. Well, they use direct deposit, right? So when I came there, they, you sign up for direct deposit. But I learned that there was still one person who got a printed check. Every other week, got a printed check. Who was that? That was the senior pastor, Pastor Mark Jeske, who, who said, I, I want to get a piece of paper, I want to go to the bank, and I want to deposit it. I think eventually it switched, but he was the last one. They grandfathered him in for that. He just didn't want to change. He didn't want to change. Some people thought he was making the change. He also didn't get his first cell phone until a few years ago. And he doesn't give anybody the number, right? And, there's a, and he's just hesitant to change, but yet is willing to change when you need to change and change for Jesus. So now um, think about yourself. Think about yourself. Now, when I take the test to find out where I am, the strength and weakness about me is that I'm where my favorite color is. I'm considered an innovator. I love ideas, I love changing. I can't even remember what I did last week, so I don't worry about changing because I can't do the same thing again. And that's my strength and my weakness, and that makes me a dangerous and also um, a great leader for a congregation such as ourselves. What we need is we need everybody in this room to be everywhere else. If everyone in this room is an innovator, we're in trouble. If everybody's a labor, we're in trouble. So think about where you might be on that chart, and wherever you are is probably exactly where God wants you to be. You might even think in your household or in your marriage where, okay, my husband is this and I'm that. It's good to have that balance. You need the innovators to come up with something. You need people to try it. You need people to say, whoa, 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 why are we doing this? Why are we doing this again? You need everybody in there to do it. Because um, I can think of a cool idea, but I need people, I need help to get the other 97.5% to go along with it, so it's a big uh, success. And so that's when we think about our congregation, and we're looking for four weeks, kind of like, how do we follow Jesus, how do we do it as a team? We have to see ourselves as a team when it comes to change and being what we're going to call moldable. 
moldable is it's a, one of our uh, core values. Here's all 10 of them. We looked at mentoring last week. Moldable is the one where we say we are willing to change any practice, but none of God's word. We are willing to change any practice, but none of God's word. You heard that in our lessons a little bit. I don't know if you could follow it, but uh, in our first lesson, we talked about women's hair covering, New Corinthians. If you look at it carefully, you'll see that he's talking about a practice uh, that in that culture, it, it really sent a message they didn't want to send if a woman didn't have her head covered. I look out at the audience, I see people with masks on, but I don't see ladies with head, heads covered, and that doesn't send us any bad message at all. For that congregation, they needed to do that, and for our congregation, we need to adjust to our culture. We take the core of that. Or when it came to, uh, to our, our next lesson, uh, Peter had to learn that the Jewish culture of how they had to eat, there was something in the Old Testament, but now that was free, and so you could do different things, and you could the gospel could go from spot to spot to spot. It was moldable, but you needed to keep Christ as the focus, the focus and the center. And then we're going to see in 1 Corinthians, the lesson I'm going to read now that we're going to apply, that the Apostle Paul is talking to what sometimes is called his problem congregation, but every congregation is a problem congregation. This just had a lot of stuff going on with a lot of gifts, a lot of issues, and he talks to them and says, in your particular circumstance, I could have demanded that you paid me, because I had that right, but he's going to start by saying, but I was flexible on that. I, even though you think, well, shouldn't you pay the person who's preaching? I'm in favor of pastors getting paid, just so you know. But you know, Paul said, even that I'm willing to adjust if it can get the gospel out better. So that's what he's going to pick up in our lesson. He's going to apply it and bring it into everything. You're going to see that he's moldable in his ministry as long as he focuses on Christ. He'll change any practice, but none of God's word. So let's get to that section from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, but we did not use this right, this right to get paid. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. It is love that verse. We put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that he will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. And this is God's word. We're going to take a look at our theme, and we're going to see that we're moldable, just like that uh, Plato. The gospel, though, is not foldable. Everything but the gospel is moldable. So we want to be moldable, not foldable. The gospel is not foldable. That's where we're going to start out today. What we can't change. That dime inside of my Plato. Okay? Again, this congregation, he was writing to uh, a congregation that had a lot of issues. They had struggles with leaders. They were divisive. They were following this person. They were too big into their own gifts and their own education, and they loved to compete with one another. And it just caused a lot of disasters. They had troubles with community. They had troubles with marriage and sexuality. They had problems, just like every group of people that gets together. But they still had Christ in the middle. And so as Paul shares this whole letter, he wants to make sure they know there's one thing that you, you can't get rid of. 
There's a lot of things I'm telling you to do, and there's some things that are options. But one thing you can't fold on, the one thing you can't get rid of, is Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. Um, in chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says this, If Christ is not raised from the dead, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. He says there, you know, my ministry and you as a church, if we don't preach that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, there is no point. Then we don't have forgiveness of sins. Then we, we don't have the truth. If you drop that, you lose it all, and there's no point whatsoever. So he says, the one thing you can't hold is the core of Jesus Christ and his grace and his life, and really everything in God's word is connected to it. So you need this core thing, but really the whole Bible underscores that you can't get rid of any part of the Bible without taking a little bit away of this. In our section here, Paul says it this way, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, I have to do this. This is not an option. We need the gospel. I need to preach it, and if I don't preach it, I'm in trouble. I've done something wrong. Woe to me. And that gospel, again, is the good news, not good advice, like we saw in Romans. It's the good news, not the good advice that in the past, God has already paid for your sins, and you're children of God, loved and saved by Jesus, and you have everything already taken care of. You are a child of God. That, that is the good news, and if you get rid of that, you've really lost everything. And that's the one thing you can't, you can't get rid of. It's the good news. So woe to us if, as individuals or as a congregation, we get busy doing really nice things, but somehow we quiet the gospel. Somehow we get away from the truth of all of God's word. And that's where we have to be careful. We can't just pick and choose. Like, for example, uh, there's certain parts of God's word that I like to preach, so I talk about that. But other parts, maybe they're controversial. Or maybe, I don't, I don't know if I really buy into that. So I might, might step back and not say some of those words. We get warnings about that in the very last book of the Bible. The Apostle John says it this way. It says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share of the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. Our job is to say everything God says and leave nothing out. That's a big task. We never do it perfectly. But what we can't hold on is like intentionally coming back from stuff. And it's sad. The reality is that pastors, congregations, church bodies will say, yeah, we want to be Christians, but we want to back off from some of the things that God has said. And it, it might seem like it's a good thing to do. Uh, for example, maybe you, you don't want to talk about creation, how God really made the world in a week, six days and he rested on the seventh day, because... You know, when we say that, then we don't sound very scientific. We don't sound very smart. And maybe I'm going to make my huge donor over there kind of upset, and maybe she's going to walk out because I said this is what the Bible says. So maybe I back off, and then maybe I just don't mention it at all. I don't want to bring it up. That's folding still on something. Or maybe it's a, a matter of sexuality. I, I want to sound connected to our modern culture that's changed some of the rights and wrongs in marriage uh, and outside of marriage. So I don't want to say the whole truth of God's word, because maybe that's going to get you mad. Maybe you're going to leave. I want to keep my organization growing. I want to keep the numbers up. I want to keep activities going. So suddenly I fold on something that's core. I throw the dime out of that thing of Plato to keep some of the Plato, right? I get rid of Christ and his message to keep on to an organization. Maybe it's uh, the role of, of men and women. Maybe it's trying to be politically correct. Maybe I want to be hip but I'm willing to fold on God's word to do that, and that's what we can't do. As a congregation, we want to make sure we're, we change what we can change, but we can't change what really makes us a congregation. And now, here, here's what often goes together. If you're a congregation that's kind of nimble, and you're good at changing things, unfortunately, that also makes you the type of person that might be willing to change a little bit on God's word. Remember that graph that I, I told you, I showed you about? That people that are way that are laggards, they don't want to change anything. Right? And so if they had God's word, they keep it, but they also don't want to change anything in the middle. They keep the same 
hymns and songs and buildings and they don't want to do anything, and that's, that's a problem too. But if you have a tendency towards being innovative, or you like change, like me, you got to watch out. Because Satan will try to get you to change more than you're supposed to change, right? And that's where I need other people in the congregation, in the ministry, to say, hey, wait, 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 wait. So you're changing this, but you're still keeping Jesus? Are you losing any of this? I think when you do that, it looks like this. Ah, that practice tends to say more than I think you're trying to say. We need people to do that because we can't lose Jesus because then we lose it all. But if we try to hang on to Jesus and try to do that, we try to say, we don't want to change anything. We know we got Jesus now, so let's just freeze everything the way we are. It also isn't carrying out Christ's mission the way the Apostle Paul directs us to do it. Everything but the gospel is moldable. And I say moldable uh, because, you know, you adjust the things that you do. You, you know what? You don't want to throw things away. I, I, that sounds like sort of crazy practice, but you think about it and you adjust. Molding is a careful thing. Where you want to say, then what are we doing this for? And you adjust it and you make it exactly the way you want. It's not by accident. It's not because everybody else is doing it. It's because you're doing it on purpose. See, a similar, you make one mistake by trying to change things. You fold on the gospel. And then you can make an opposite mistake by saying, I want to put these other things in the do not change ever category. And it happens real easily. It just does. For a Christian... However you came to faith, however you worshipped or grew up, a lot of things came along with the gospel of Jesus. And so you're used to that, and those things were so great and precious to you that it might be hard for you to imagine uh, how Christians could go without that. It's so awesome that you absolutely love it that this has got to be part of it. You just can't picture it. You just It's always been together. And especially if you've ever experienced something else, you may just assume they have to go together but then you can start to lock in and add things to the Word of God, and then you're stuck. Let me just give you an example that I've experienced by some wonderful Christians, and it was interesting to work through it. Uh, for this group of Christians I served, they said, you know, every Christian, they have to get together, and you need to have a church building, and you need to have a, a steeple on that church building, and in that steeple, you need to have a bell that you ring for church. Now, before I talk about that, you might notice that as we gather today, we are not in a church building. We're in the multi-purpose room of a school, and we do not have a steeple, and we do not have a bell, okay? But I want to talk about this church. It was a, it was a struggle because these wonderful people had always had a church building. They'd always had a steeple. they always had a bell. And every church they could see in their community that they knew of, that their relatives went to, they all had a building, they had a steeple, and they had a bell. But they built a new building, and they just didn't have enough money to put the steeple on. And so the bell was sitting inside one of the members' barns in the back, and it wasn't ringing. It was absolutely drove some people crazy. And what we had to do was talk about, well, why do we have a bell? And they had to think about it. Well, why do we have a bell? Because we've always had a bell. Well, was the purpose of the bell originally to ring to people to tell them that the circuit riding pastor was finally in town? And was the bell there to let people know church is coming on in an hour? And did the bell have this amazing, great purpose that you needed to have it? Uh, like when I went to Zambia, they still ring a bell like that. It's not a bell, but it's like a, a, it's the center of a tire, a tire rim. And you take a big hammer and you clang on as hard as you can to let everybody know they're actually having church. If you actually use it the way a bell was originally used. Well, that congregation had the rest of I guess we could have church without a bell. But eventually, they did get the bell. They never got a steeple. But they did get a contraption to make the bell ring because it was a neat connection to their history. They didn't need to have it, but it still was a neat thing to do, but you had to wrestle with it. And for us here, we have to talk about everything. I think during COVID, churches have had to wrestle with can we be in church if we can't get together in person? How do we proclaim God's word when we're not allowed to do different things? How, how do we do it? What actually is essential? And what is changeable. And the vast majority of what we do is very moldable and changeable. Um, and like in our church right now, it's really neat that we don't have to spend any of our resources on a building or utilities or Wi-Fi. We can put all our, all our finances into people and ministry and activities. Uh, that's a great reason not to have a building. And more and more right now, uh, Christian churches are discovering if you can avoid having a building, that helps send the message that church is not an institution. 
uh, in, the, in the sense that all these people don't like institutions. They're staying away from it. It's about people. That's what the church is. It's really people. And so not having a building helps send that message. So a lot of people are to send that might be a really good method, but it might be different in one neighborhood, in one city, at a different time. You need to be flexible. Um, Paul says it. We have to adjust to the culture of our people. Whoever we're serving, we need to adjust. He says it this way. For those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. The one not free from God's law, but of under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. The weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. So did you notice Paul says it's not about his personal preference. It's about purpose. It's not about his personal preference. It's about purpose. I'm pretty confident that Paul loved Jewish stuff. I'm pretty confident he liked Jewish food and Jewish culture. I'm pretty confident he grew up in that and loved it, was comfortable with it. But he said that's, that wasn't the most important thing. I'll change whatever I can to win those not having the law, to win the weak, that it might save some. It's worth it. Whatever we need to change or to reach a new soul, I'm willing to give up my personal preference. And that's kind of weird as an organization. Most organizations are about who's already in it. But really, every Christian congregation is really all about who's not in it. It's not about, it's not about you. It's about our Lord and Savior. Um, and all our decisions can be about our personal preference. They have to be about purpose. And that's tough to check ourselves. As the pastor, I, it's pretty easy to influence, and I can get things the way I like it. Um, but yet it's not about what I necessarily want. But several years ago, I was at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and I got to hear was talking to some guys, and I heard them talking, and there was a future pastor who said something, and I might have sounded just like this when I was at seminary, but he said, I can't wait till I'm a pastor. I know exactly what worship is going to be like. You know, I, I'm looking forward to starting these programs. And he had a couple things in mind, and I thought to myself, eh, maybe what I sounded like, but if he doesn't know where he's going yet, and he hasn't met the people to know the gifts and talents they have, and he hasn't met the unchurched and non-Christian people in the community, he really doesn't have a clue of what he's supposed to do or how he's supposed to do it. He just knows from his experience he really likes certain things, and he seems to be really effective in certain spots. And so we always have to pause, and for us, we always have to be in listen mode and understand why we're here is not for us. It makes us happy, but it's really for everybody who didn't make it here today. Everybody in our neighborhood that would love to come in but just hasn't met us yet. Everybody that doesn't know Jesus and understand what's great about doing what we're doing, that's why we exist. So we have to be constantly listening, constantly talking to people and figuring out how can we serve them and be ready to say it's not about my personal preference, it's about my purpose to serve those people. And in every organization, we hear each other more. And we should take our opinions on things and take surveys we have to make sure to listen to the people that aren't here. That means being out there, meeting them, and listening to them, and talking to them. Now, I got to hear a pastor from a congregation that was really growing amongst millennials and next gens. And he said the key for him is making sure people realize the church is not all about them. It is about them. But it's first and foremost about Jesus, and then it's about serving the people that don't know Jesus. So at, at, at service... He would make everybody hold up their hand and say, repeat after me, it's not all about me. And they'd say, it's not all about me. To help me remember that idea, I have what I think is a funny video as an illustration. So these are not worship hymns that we're going to sing. But as an example, if you're really hyper-focused on yourself, uh, then you might end up with songs like this. And this is not what carries out the mission of Jesus. So um, hopefully, hopefully it'll work and hopefully you'll like it. Now, the greatest collection of me you worship ever assembled on one CD. It's all 20 songs, all about you. This amazing collection is great to share with friends if you want. Join in the worship with you, for you, and about you. Because you are unique, and you love you. All the 
That's not what we're doing. That was not the Apostle Paul talking. Uh, it's not about. It's not about me. You can put that in your head. And let's just, let's just make it real practical, okay? Uh, what, where are we right now? We've been changing our worship space. And what are we going to do in the future? Like we were at the Great Hall before. Came out. We have different lights, different things. We're partying. We're going to put the sound thing in the back. And we've been having all these discussions. Where do we put the chairs? And guess what? It's all. That's all holdable. We can even decide not to have in-person worship go back to being recorded. We can even avoid recording and just worship in our homes in different ways. That's all an option. And whenever we come to discussion, you should feel totally free to come up with some, what might sound like a crazy idea. Because we can get rid of it all as long as we hang on to Christ. And just be ready to, to work and adjust. Because what we're really trying to solve is not what makes you happy, right? We're not trying to get what's awesome for you um, we're trying to figure out how can we help the people that aren't here be here. How, how can what we do help get the gospel? If we could, if we need to shut down Sunday worship so we can reach more people in different ways, maybe we can put our energy in that. That needs to be an option for us, us to think about it. But we need to know who those people are, and we're empowered by that because we don't do that perfectly. We we do opt for our own personal preferences. We do opt for our ease. And for that sin, we have a Savior who said, you know what? I'm going to put your culture first. And our Savior Jesus, he just said, I'm going to love you so much, I'm going to come into your culture, and I'll adjust my life and live in your perfect human style, right? Because I love you that much. And then I'm going to come and adjust my whole life because it's good for you. His personal preference, he said, it's not, not, not to say my will to die, but Heavenly Father, if that's what you want, I'm willing to do it. He put all of our needs first and adjusted everything for us in the ultimate perfect way. So when God sees you, you and me, he sees us as ones who put everybody else first as perfect children. And he sees that our sins of personal preference and our own stagnation, our willingness to change the wrong thing or not change what we need to change, it's all taken away by our Savior Jesus. And then he gives us the power to go forward. So what can we change and adjust as a congregation? Pretty much almost anything. Accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Of course, at times, what we wear, what we all do, but everything needs to be on purpose. But I mean, I like wearing the suit. This is, I like wearing the suit, but I wore it because I thought it'd be a good change to pay someone to talk about my mustard suit, right? But if this like threw you off, I would change. And as a pastor, I've worn everything from jeans and a t-shirt up front to a nice, I mean, an amazing white robe with a uh, and all with a surplus and everything. I've worn all that with a big cross on it. I've worn a black robe. I've worn, I've worn everything, but it's changed not because of what I like, but because of what, where I was in an audience preference. And same with the way you dress and what you do. There isn't one right way, but it needs to be for the gospel. So I, I want to take you back to our logo. Now, every single um, core value is not in our logo. I, I mentioned it last week was mentoring, where you see the two people in the middle, and they're connected. They're touching people. They're kind of mentoring and pulling them in. Um, but when it comes to change and being multiple, um, I want to let you know that this logo that's like oh, about two years old actually already has been changed. Okay, uh, I wanted to find the old file, but I did. Originally, those crosses inside the people were not the picture. Okay, we, we want to design a logo that would, would be inviting and would be good colors. And we put the Trinity, we put God in the triangle in the middle, and God's people there. But as I was reaching out to one of the families, they said, you know, it seemed kind of odd to them that there wasn't a cross on a Christian church thing. They said, they like it. It didn't have to be a big cross. It's kind of in your face. But, you know, they kind of thought, you know, if it's a Christian church, I mean, you should probably have a cross on it somewhere. Right? And I went, 
that sounds like a good idea. So I, I bounce it off and I talk to some more people. I showed them this, and then I got a graphic artist to put a nice little white crosses on there, right on the people where Jesus comes into the power of baptism and does it. And I showed it to people and they said they really like that. And so we changed it. We changed it. Uh, what is nice is we didn't take Jesus out, but literally we actually put more Jesus in the picture, right? Which is a reminder we need to change, but it's, other people may bring it up. Other people may mention it. And then we do it. Why? To add more Jesus in to communicate that message. So let me ask you if now you're thinking when it comes to, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, but it's your idea to change, it's pretty easy to change. So get behind what we can change from the gospel, then it becomes your idea. And as a family, we can do that by discussing, be patient with one another. But if you're willing to change anything, because you know it's not all about you, if you're willing to change anything for the gospel of Christ, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Amen, amen indeed. Uh, I invite you, why don't you stand up, get a chance to, get a chance to stand and stretch and get some of that uh, blood fall back into your uh, brain. And let's join and say our uh, Bible passage together. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Psalm 145, verse 13. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to click it. Uh, you can, you know, this is our giving page. A reminder, we have our offering over there. You can give online in different ways. Um, well, I'm going to have you stay standing. We have a short little a short little song that might it's very difficult to sing along with. Is the final verse in a hymn that Martin Luther wrote that reminds us what we can't change and what we must change. It really fits well for a thing, but it's tough to sing along, so if you don't feel comfortable singing, don't feel bad. I probably won't need to throw you off, but let's join in and listen to the worship of the song. us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. 
Lord, we pray for the schools that are reopening in Milwaukee and in surrounding communities. Lord, we ask you to bless all the work that has been put in to get the schools to a point where they can open and the students can start coming in. Please keep the plague away from us. Teach us to discipline ourselves to do the things that we know reduce the chances of bringing in the disease and spreading it. And bring us together and bless the learning. Bless the chance that these students have to grow in worldly wisdom, but even more so to grow in their knowledge and their love for you as they hear God's word every day. Father, we also uh, pray this morning for Mrs. Steinberg. We ask that you would give her relief from the pain in her back that has been tormenting her these past few days. Restore her strength and let her return to her daily labors in the schools without the discomfort and the pain. Finally, we also remember, the Lord, we ask your blessing and protection and comfort on those in the Western United States where fires and smoke have brought destruction on a scale that those of us who are not there can probably not even be with the families of those who have lost loved ones, of all those who have lost their homes, their businesses, their jobs and means of support, who are homeless and are looking for a place to stay as winter is coming. Help the communities to rebuild and help people to rebuild their lives. And Lord, if it be your will, send rain to quench the fires so that they can start the process of putting their lives together again. Lord, use all of these disasters and calamities, which to us it seems that this year has been so full of, use these to bring people to you and to trust in you rather than in ourselves. Lord, we pause as each of us brings you our silent prayers. ourselves and one another and all of our neighbors to your loving care. We ask that you would bring those who do not know Jesus as their Savior to saving faith while there is yet time. And we join in praying the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Back on the service, that's uh, say, hey, I was hard to see this. Like, have you got any idea 
I mean, can share with anybody here that looks like they're involved. Um, I do, I do want to give a special thank you to uh, Brenda DeMars over there, who is, she knows lights and she's figuring things out. So I, I know she doesn't want me to do this, but I don't care. Um, let's, can we just give her a round of applause for her? <laughs> You're not going to get into it, but she did, I mean, it helped to make it work, and I just, I'm just really glad. We have people that are tuning in and streaming and trying to figure out that you don't come every week or whatever, and that keeps them connected and trying to get it figured out. Uh, a lot of people did a lot of stuff, but Brenda really is strictly, truly a volunteer. So um, I just love that she thanked me for having her get involved. Like, I asked her to do all of this stuff, and she comes in yesterday. Uh, so again, give some feedback on what you think and how it looks, and we'll continue to, to work on it going forward. Um, and especially think about the people that aren't, aren't here. Um, anybody have any other announcements or anything that they need to share? Um, so coming up, uh, we have in two weeks, I'm going to continue this series on mercy, but we're blessed to be involved in ministry training. So we have one of my good friends, uh, uh, seminarian Ron Kelly, uh, who will be here guest preaching. I'll still be here next week. But he'll be delivering his message on that. And then uh, uh, as you leave today, you can visit one another. But um, I think I'm still going to go grab some, I think we still have some ice cream sandwiches. Uh, Ch uh, Fred, uh, Chaplain Frederick has uh, food pantry bags, and we're open our food pantry in general that uh, we advertised last week. We got a couple people to come in there, so people may come on in. Uh, so make sure when you see somebody come on in that you stop talking to one another and talk to the new people coming in. Uh, another uh, important thing to do, and if you have any ideas or prayers or anything for the future, just connect with any of us or send that on in. So, God's blessings, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.